welcome back to the Investing on the Go podcast brought to you by Fun Caliber. In today's episode, we're discussing the magical world of fixed income, explaining terms such as duration, looking at the opportunities in different parts of the market, and trying to forecast the path for the UK economy and inflation. I'm Darius McDermott from Fun Caliber. Today, we are here to talk about the magical world of fixed income investing. Invesco run many fixed income funds, and this is their most flexible offering. So I'm delighted to be joined by Stuart Edwards today. He's the manager of the Invesco Tactical Bond Fund. Good morning, Stuart. Oh, good morning, Darius. So your fund, I, I, I'm aware uh, that you have a broad range of products, huge amounts of colleague and resource. This is the go anywhere, do anything fund. Um, Tell us a little bit about the fund and, and and what you've been doing in the last eighteen to twelve to eighteen months. Because for once, bonds have not been boring. In fact, maybe they've been a bit too exciting. What do you say? Uh, yes. Um, look, I mean, if you go back uh, prior to the last eighteen months or so, I mean, really, um, uh, you know, our asset class bonds were just offering no value. You know, it's a very very tricky period for a long period of time. Um, as we know, central banks uh, in the in the in the wake of the financial crisis um, set interest rates very low. Um, they employed lots of unconventional policies, quantitative easing, etc., which really did, uh, to my mind at least, uh, distort uh, valuations. And of course, in the past eighteen months, that has changed significantly. Um, and we know the reasons why. We can come on to that uh, a bit later. Um, so the tactical bond fund, uh, yes, it's um, it is our most uh, flexible strategy in in our uh, stable of, of products. It's conceived, or it was conceived, with a view to um, drawing upon the resources within the team, uh, all the best ideas, be that uh, credit, so investment grade credit, high yield, um, interest rate strategies, and emerging markets as well. So. You know, really, to my mind, it's um, it's a great product uh, for the uh, macro environment that we we are in, which, as you've alluded to, is is very volatile. And have you made any? I would say interest rates have moved dramatically, and as we know, there's a direct relationship between interest rates and returns on bonds. How have you been uh, playing that over the last say year or so to either try and defend when it was a bit more trickier last year? or maybe more into the rebound when markets bottomed around the October time? Yeah, so, I mean, the first point I'd make is that valuations you know, have, have changed uh, significantly. So if you think about the three-year period up to the end of uh, 2021, 10-year um, UK government uh, bond yields, so that's guilt yields, were for most of that period less than 1%. And actually, if you yeah. look at the equivalent German government bonds, it was negative. Um, which now seems quite extraordinary. So there's been a massive, massive change in valuations. And in that earlier period, um, we, we just didn't like valuations. We just felt that bond yields were too low and you really uh, weren't getting paid um, for, for taking taking risk. And of course, that, that's changed. So we have adapted our uh, strategy over the past 18 months. Um, you know, even though we would happily concede that the macroeconomic risks as they relate to growth and inflation have increased, uh, valuations have changed. So we have adjusted the portfolio. We've taken our interest uh, exposure up. That's our duration exposure. That's the sensitivity of, of bond prices to changes in interest rates. We've increased that, recognizing that um, with all of the monetary tightening that's in the system, um, eventually, and it is a complicated picture because there's lots of conflicting data, but eventually that will lead to slower economic growth. So in that type of environment, it does make sense to us to, to increase the duration exposure of the fund. So look, that gives me a perfect segue into, I think, one of the, the, the things that most, most investors struggle to understand, which is duration. Would you be kind enough to have a stab at explaining duration in layman's terms for our listeners and then just follow up on your last um, point about the movement in duration and how that how you might actually make money yeah sure um i'll um i'll, I'll try and uh, explain that so um, sometimes it's not easy it's more, I, I, it's more easily said than done but it absolutely um, is. yeah um so look it, you know most assets um that have an income stream do have an element of duration 
Um, I mean, what, what has been interesting in the last couple of years is that there were periods when tech stocks, for example, um, took a really big hit. And, and that was um, less to do with uh, uh, views over you know, the structural outlook and the ability to generate profits. And it was more about changes in interest rates and insofar as that affects um, uh, you know, what are essentially long growth assets. So, so most assets do have a duration element to them. Now, fixed income assets, um, by definition, because they have a fixed income stream over a period of time, are more uh, sensitive to, to changes in, in interest rates. So think of it like this. You have a stream of um, interest payments or income an income stream um, over a period of time. And that income stream, when interest rates change, so either current interest rates or expectations over interest rates, then the value today of that future uh, stream uh, uh, changes. So if interest rates go up, that means the future income stream uh, is discounted at a higher rate and, and the price of um, that income stream or the price of the bond uh, falls. Um, and of course, the longer the maturity of, of the bonds, um, that means that you know there's more income streams in the future, the greater the seven, uh, sensitivity to changes in interest rates. So it works in both directions. When interest rates fall, then bond prices uh, rise. So if you're, you're a bond investor, that means you lend money to companies and governments. If And some of those loans are shorter in time, a shorter duration, and some are longer in time. So you add up the average of those maturities or durations to get a maturity on the fund. So... I know a neutral duration or a neutral average is roughly 7% in investment grade world. So to my mind, that means if interest rates go up by a full 1%, not one interest rate rise, but a full 1%, that if the maturity average or duration on the fund is, say, 7 that you might expect to lose 7% of your capital, plus or minus a little bit for some technical reasons that we're def definitely not going to go into today. And then the converse is true, that if interest rates go down, actually, the value of your bonds actually go up based on those future cash generations that you've described. Yes, that's right. Um, I couldn't put it better myself. Um, that's 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 basic sort of bond maths as it, as it relates to uh, Duration and and of course it's also not just about as I think I mentioned um, the interest rate today, but it's also expectations for the future. And if you expect economic growth to progressively become more challenged, as we do, then you can have more confidence in given current valuations and increasing uh, the duration profile of the fund. Now, I mean, if you go back eighteen months. In this fund, because of the nature of the fund and the fact that it is very flexible, we had a very, very, very defensive position on duration. In fact, it was around zero. It was that low. It was, um, and as you've said, in a typical investment grade fund would have been closer to seven. So we just really did not like valuations at the start of 2022. But as well, that's an extra lever that you have within this fully flexible mandate, is you don't have to be anchored around that seven-year neutral duration like lots of corporate bonds. That's not to say that that's a bad thing. It's just you've got that extra flexibility, and as long as you're right in your assumptions, you can actually be more defensive or indeed more aggressive with that rate movement over time. Yes, that's that's right, yes. So let's just delve into to the fund. So I see you – it looks like you've got a bit more emerging market exposure in the fund, which to my mind increases risk. Um, have you increased risk on the fund? And what have you done with that sort of area where crossover area, as it's known, with where investment grade meets high yield? Are you actually increasing risk or at this time, are you, are you decreasing risk? Well, it's an interesting question because the answer um, – uh, it's, 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 a, it's a bit nuanced. So if, right. if firstly, uh, take the bigger picture. Um, if I'm framing the world that I'm operating in, um, and, and really to, to simplify, 2022, to my mind, was about inflation. Um, it was the inflation shock, and it was the way central banks um, responded to that. Um, they, they were behind in the interest rate cycle, and they had to hike rates aggressively, which, as we know, has, has led to this huge drawdown in, in uh, fixed income mar uh, markets and bond markets. And then 2024, if we think forward, 
I can foresee a situation where economic growth really does start to deteriorate as the lagged impact of monetary tightening really does start to bite. But, but this year is quite messy. Um, you know, I describe it as a transition year between inflation risks and growth risks. So, so in a sense, it's not you know necessarily obvious that you you want to be really loading up on risk or be really defensive at the same time. We we have to acknowledge that valuations are a lot better. So it's about finding pockets of of value um, whilst also thinking about the big picture. So what what does that mean? Well, in, in one sense, and as we've already talked about. Yes, we've taken the interest rate exposure up of the fund. So we've taken the duration risk up. We could take it up further, by the way. Uh, you know, it's it, we, it could increase further, but we've taken it up, recognizing that bond yields, government bond yields are more attractive and recognizing that we're probably in a progressively deteriorating economic environment. But it just takes time. At the same time, we've reduced our high yield exposure. So that's... Um, uh, corporate bonds at the lower end of the credit um, spectrum. So you have investment grade and you have high yield. So we've reduced the high yield exposure, thinking that this deteriorating economic environment um, you know, raises the medium to longer term risks of, of holding that asset class. And you mentioned emerging markets. The emerging markets is a really broad church, and we have to remember that. So you have hard currency emerging market bonds, and by that, we're talking about typically US dollar denominated bonds, um, but we also have local currency bonds as well. So that's bonds issued by the larger emerging markets in their own local currencies, where the sensitivity to their own interest rate cycles um, is, is a lot greater. So the reason why we've found some selective or why we've increased our exposure in some, I, I would say, very selective opportunities um, is because some of these central banks have, if anything, been even more aggressive than the Bank of England, the US Federal Reserve, to so think Mexico, think Brazil. You know, these are two countries that really did raise rates quite aggressively. And as a consequence, you know, we found some quite attractive valuations in these markets. And, and they've, in the face of some real global challenges, um, geopolitical challenges, um, US dollar strengthening at times, actually what we found is that it's been a really good diversifier looking at opportunities in these markets um, because they, they they sort of held their own and they're, they're paying some very attractive yields. So to my mind, I mean, I think all fund managers have to consider the world around them and what's happening because it affects. But I think within fixed income, and particularly having a view on future growth and hence future interest rate movements and hence currency, which we just touched on a little bit, you have to be a bit of a forecaster. And um, I know that previous to your uh, job as a fund manager, you worked for Standard & Poor's, which is a fund rate, uh, a bond ratings agency, apart from, from other things. And one of your roles was to forecast UK economic data, which must have been um, lots of fun and slightly challenging over the years. So what, as a somebody with that background, is your outlook for the UK today? Well, Darius, that does take me back a, a, a while, um, I have to say. Uh, you know, that's how I, I sort of cut my teeth um, as a UK economist. Uh, that was in the late 90s, just as the Bank of England had been, uh, or at least it, um, the Bank of England's uh, um, uh, gains um, operational independence for setting monetary policy. So it was a great period. And, and actually, um, you know, back then, it was a very data rich, macro rich environment, as, as perhaps you yourself will remember. Um, uh, you know, it was it was the new sort of game, um, trying to predict UK interest rates, etc. And then, as, as, as I said earlier, we had a you know what really amounted to a, a you know a fallow period because interest rates were were suppressed in the wake of the GFC, so it became boring again. And and now we've come full circle, and um, you know we were in this incredible environment where not only we predict an interest rate rises, but it's also the size of the rises as, as well. Um, so it's quite extraordinary, uh, you know, where we've come from and where we are at at the moment, and. Um, you know, I don't envy um, uh, economists now because you know you you difficult to really to, to get right, and 
Um, it, it's an extremely tricky environment. And we know that from what the central bankers are telling us. I mean, they don't really know at the moment. So it was almost right. easier last year when they were hiking interest rates aggressively, sort of playing catch up. Now we're in this period where, you know, we suspect they're not far away from a pause. Now, now we don't know what the aftermath of that looks like, whether we'll get rate cuts or or indeed whether there is a risk that they'll have to hike further. And I wouldn't totally dismiss that. So it's a very, very tricky environment. Um, you know, and that's my way of sort of saying uh, there is a sort of some caution to my own predictions and I, I don't make point forecasts anymore. Um, the way I train the UK economy, if you go back uh, a few months, um, back to the autumn of, of last year, it was a particularly tricky period. We had the um, the onset of the cost of living crisis, which was clearly being exacerbated by higher energy prices, um, uh, which impacted the UK's uh, terms of, of trade. The pound fell and it was a very, very precarious in, environment. And then, of course, we had the mini budget as well um, in the UK, which uh, uh, led to an increase in expectations around Bank of England policy rates. So all of these things sort of conspired to create a very, very negative narrative um, for the UK economy. So actually what we find now, right, relative to those expectations, is actually the UK economy hasn't been as bad as what um, most analysts had, had really been, been expecting. So we have to sort of set that context um, things haven't turned out quite as bad. Energy prices have come off, and, and actually the Bank of England hasn't had to hike as much as what was projected at, at the time. But what I would say is that um, you know going forward, we've still got um, a lot of the monetary tightening still to feed through. Only recently, the Bank of England themselves um, did an analysis of the transition uh, mechanism of monetary policy as it relates to to the mortgage market, for example, and um, they made the point that um, interest rates have gone up uh, for new mortgages have gone up three hundred basis points. That's three percent, but actually, on average, for most people who have a mortgage, rates have only gone up um, by three quarters of a percent because there's far more fixed mortgage rate deals now. Than there were when you know I was making these forecasts twenty years ago. Um, yeah. So actually, this transition mechanism is a lot slower. Um, uh, and so you know, I I think that it's going to remain challenging the economic environment. And as as more and more um, mortgage deals uh, come up for renewal, then you know that's going to hit people's pockets. So you know, I'm 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 reasonably downbeat. I think on the economic environment heading towards the end of this year and in, into 2024. So ultimately, that should so support um, certainly government bond yields in the UK. So then, uh, to my mind, the final piece of the puzzle, not just for fixed income, but potentially for equities as well, is a view on inflation, um, a potential disinflation, uh, not my base case, I might add, but... Um, because inflation is the sort of thing causing central banks to do these rate rises. What's your view on inflation? Again, I, I predict you'll have slightly different views depending on the geographies. But if we start with maybe a few words on UK, just to finish off the UK, and then maybe on the US. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm, you know, I, I'd make the point up front. I'm quite, you know, quite sceptical about um, inflation or this idea. Some people have called it an, an, an immaculate disinflation. Um, you now, I'm quite sceptical about that. So in other words, you know, I think it's going to be a bit of a tall order for inflation to head back um, towards central bank targets, uh, in, you know, in a sort of clean manner um, anytime soon. Um, and that's not just in the UK, that's, that's elsewhere. Uh, you know, on the other hand, what I would say is we're probably past peak headline inflation. Um, and that stands to reason, given that energy prices have, have come off and, you know, barring a, a significant reacceleration in energy prices or commodity prices, then I think we've probably seen the peak in headline inflation that was likely um, last autumn. Um, but core inflation, uh, you know, it's a real mixed picture. On the one hand, goods prices have come off because many of the supply bottlenecks that 
that we witnessed last year and in 2021 are these. So think transportation costs, shipping costs, et cetera, they've come off. But then on the other hand, services inflation is proving somewhat stickier than people had, had hoped for. Um, you know, why is that? Well, you know, I would cite two reasons. Firstly, um, as we've come out of COVID and economies have opened up, there's a lot of demand for, for tra travel and, and leisure and uh, restaurants, et cetera. Um, and then there's also private sector wage stickiness as well. Um, it's not surprising that uh, uh, private sector workers and indeed public sector workers, as we've seen with a lot of the strike action in the UK, are pushing for higher uh, wage settlements um, because of the you know the high levels of inflation. So it just takes time. Now, eventually, inflation pressures will will ease because if the economic environment is slowing, then it makes sense that um, profit margins, which uh, up until this point have really held up and, and been been supported, um, will likely be be eroded away as as you know the economic environment becomes a lot more challenging. So I think eventually inflation pressures will ease, but but it, it's it's a it's a tricky path to that uh, destination, to my mind. Stuart, thank you very much for your time this morning. That's been a really interesting run through, not just of your fund, but also the prevailing macro uh, environment in which uh, you have to operate in. Investor Tactical Bond has just been awarded an Elite Radar badge from Fund Caliber. And as we've heard today, it's the most flexible fund in Fund Caliber's fixed income range. This means the team can make the most of all the opportunities presented across the market. To learn more about the Invesco Tactical Bond Fund, visit fundcaliber.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Investing on the Go podcast available wherever you get your podcasts. Please remember, we've been discussing individual companies to bring investing to life for you. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell. The fund may or may not still hold these companies at the time of listening. Elite ratings are based on Fund Caliber's research methodology and are the opinion of Fund Caliber's research team only. Mm -hmm.